a um, pivot and a, uh, you know, you had a conversation today with somebody and said, you can't stay still, right? With, uh, if you're, if you're, if you're operating in a market, as soon as you freeze, you can uh, limit your, uh, you know, opportunity. And uh, so that, that definitely has, uh, it's going to be interesting to see which practices um, pivot their, their marketing strategy to the new, um, you know, the new patient flow that's available in their, in their particular area. So it's yeah, be interesting. I think right now, I mean, there are limitations to a lot of things that you can do with your practice. You know, the kind of air exchange in the room, the staff coming back, um, you know, PPE. And those are pretty much right. kind of fixed and there's not really much you can do, you know, um, in that regards, right? I think the biggest variable is marketing. And um, I think how successful a practice will be after this will based on how well they do the marketing. And um, and communication, yeah. right? To me, communication yeah. goes hand in hand with the marketing. Um, yeah. When you communicate with the existing patients, I you know that's also considered marketing, you know, what you kind of set up, right? So, uh, yeah, so I think that makes a, uh, I think that's a huge, huge, huge uh, difference, right? Um, I think at the end of the day, we don't know what the future will hold, uh, how this virus will work and what cases we get, and how people feel in government policies and whatnot. Uh, but it's critical to focus on marketing. Um, you know, even if it doesn't work out, um, you know, at least you're doing something and you're positioning yourself to succeed, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, so from your end, are there any other issues or other things that your clients are contemplating about? Well, I mean, in terms of the mergers and acquisitions market, it's been still active. Um, there's buyers and sellers, there's deals flow, uh, banks are still lending. Mm -hmm. And um, transactions that were in, in process pre-COVID mm -hmm. are um, are now coming, are closing you know, a little later on um, now now that there's more uh data as to the office how it's doing so it's been uh it's been interesting so we'll have to see how uh, things go through the fall right i mean uh uh the cash flows are, are have been pretty strong in the last three months um mm -hmm. uh, when offices opened up but uh everyone's kind of got their eye on uh, the next quarter uh october november december to see how that plays out because typically it's been busy in a dental office in October, November, December, because people would try and uh, realize on their insurance benefits because they hadn't used them. And uh, a lot of people would, um, you know, use that as a way to go back and make their dental appointment. So typically the last quarter of a year is, is very busy. So, <clears throat> Some dentists have told me that uh, there's a lot more um, um, cash flow in people's pocket in terms of they're not going on vacation, they're not, uh, you know, doing as many leisure things, and there's more excess cash available. So some dentists have indicated that they're able to now, the patients are coming back and saying, look, I want to do that ortho treatment, or I want to do that veneer, or I want to proceed with uh, a uh, procedure that was um, sort of voluntary. Um, and then they're because they have some cash flow available to them that they um, have saved up because they're still working mm -hmm. and um, they have some extra money that they're not using and they weren't spending on other things. So they're, they're sort of investing it back in themselves. Mm -hmm. So, but the other thing that'd be interesting to see is that if there's a, if there's a percentage of people who don't go back to the dentist, um, for extended period of time to do like their regular hygiene uh, uh, appointment, there's a possibility that there could be a further, uh, you know, demand of dentistry in 2021 in terms of more complicated procedures, because somebody who may have missed their hygiene appointment, if they're on like a three month recall and they didn't go in March and they didn't go in June and then now they're not going in September and they don't go in December, then they can have an entire year where they didn't have any, um, hygiene done or fluoride treatment and that could uh, result in them having more complicated dental uh, procedures going into 2021 in terms of period you know perio issues or 
complicated endo or maybe more extraction. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to see how that all resonates into 2021. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, because the hygiene programs are still, some offices have not, um, you know, uh, fully engaged all their hygienists. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a possibility that could be, you know, a resurgence in uh, complicated dentistry uh, into 2021, right? So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of changes that are happening. You see almost every aspect of of the economy, of society <clears throat> is changing. So definitely there will be a lot of opportunities uh, in the dental, uh, dental space. So it's very important you know, for you to stay, for everyone to stay up to date and, you know, be ready, be agile, always uh, kind of uh, investing in, you know, initiatives and seeing opportunities and seeing issues and and just pivoting your practice. So that's definitely, I think, the number one tip. So we're starting about two minutes. So, uh, yeah, so we will have a good one for you guys. For a tool here, so a tool have done uh, quite a few, quite a few of these for us. Yeah, we've had um, quite uh, quite a few um, opportunities, and it's been a great way to, um, you know, summarize some of our thinking and you know, and some of our um, information for uh, the dental community. You know, there's no more trade shows and everything's online, and you know, usually we'd be preparing for the winter clinic kind of thing right now, mm-hmm. so without that um, happening, I think it's a good way for everybody to, um, you know, collaborate uh, by using uh, this platform to, um, you know, get information out to everyone in terms of mm-hmm. what's happening in the market. So it's been uh, great. But I think we have another one coming up too, I think in October. Yeah, so we have a panel discussion in October that's coming up. Uh, we're working on a panel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll keep uh, keep the ball yeah, rolling. Yeah, that one should be. You know. Actually, we uh, our firm uh, our firm sponsors UFT, and uh, they sent me an email yesterday with uh, they're trying to do like a virtual uh, uh, kind of like a trade show. So I'm not sure how that's going to work, but uh, we're uh, we're speaking to them about that uh, next week to see how uh, how how they're going to do that. So it's interesting to see how uh, technology has played a role in uh, the uh, post-COVID uh, world, so. Yeah, for sure. I'll we'll just start in a few seconds from now. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Hello everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Atul Mira. I'm the founder of m Co Chartered Professional Accountants and the leader of our mergers and acquisitions healthcare division. Our firm has advised on hundreds of dental practice acquisitions over the last 15 years. If you are thinking about purchasing a dental practice, you do not want to miss our webinar on Tuesday, September 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. When purchasing a dental practice, It is vital that you understand the process from A to Z. This understanding will ensure that you will reduce purchase risks and negotiate the best deal. On Tuesday, September 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, we will continue our webinar series in partnership with Dentistry Business and invite you to join me on our educational webinar titled Dental Practice Purchase 101, Everything You Need to Know Financially When Buying a Practice. Our webinar is eligible for your dental college education credit, along with the Academy of General Dentistry AGD PACE program credit. In this webinar, you will learn important insider tips about the financial due diligence process when purchasing a dental practice, guidance on conducting a chart audit, how to obtain the best available bank financing, tips on designing a COVID-19 action plan to protect your investment, and understanding the difference between purchasing the assets versus the shares of a dental practice from a tax perspective, and how to properly plan and structure the purchase of your practice to claim the $883,000 lifetime capital gains exemption 
on the future sale of your practice. As an added bonus, this webinar will also include a fall 2020 dental economic update and a module on tax planning ideas for the coming 2020 taxation year. If you're thinking about purchasing a dental practice, you do not want to miss this webinar on Tuesday, September 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Look forward to seeing you then. Still there? Okay. Hey, Sharky, you still there? No, oh, there you are. <laughs> Did you yeah. want to go ahead and uh, finish off this slide presentation at the beginning here? Or do you want me to get started? Turkey? Oh, uh, I guess he got frozen. So I guess I'll start. You hear me? Oh, there you are. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> you were frozen okay. for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want me uh, to go ahead uh, and start or did you, because you have your slides up here. Yeah, I'll just do the intro quickly. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you for attending another great webinar here for uh, Dentistry Business where we bring the top uh, dental speakers and thought leaders in the industry to help educate and uh, prepare you for success, no matter what type of environment you're in, such as uh, the one we're in right now. Um, so we've done over 30... all the way oh I think you froze again there Sharky how oh, you froze again are you back yeah <laughs> So, uh, so I'm the founder and CEO of Dentist Fine, a result-driven dental marketing platform. We help dental practice increase patient flow uh, by at least 40 up to 200% using our technology and our services. Uh, for me, I also teach the dental marketing course at the University of Toronto. And Dentist Fine started in 2010 and we have over 20 to 30 uh, employees now focus on creating a technology and research to help you succeed in patient acquisition. And our feature speaker here today is Dr. Atua Murad. He holds- Not a doctor. <laughs> Pardon? Not a doctor. Do Sorry, mister. Yeah, Mr. Atua Murad. Um, So he holds in. So he holds an honors bachelor's of com. Hello. Uh, maybe you can take it over. There seems to be some technical issues on my end. Your mic is off. The mic, mic is on. Is that good? Yeah, now you're good. Is that good? Yeah. 
Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. Oh wait, uh, do you want screen share or you want I slides? Try this share share. Yeah, but you can see it. See if it. It didn't work the slide. Are you here, Atul? Low. Things, but it's working perfectly uh, during the backstage pre before we started. There. So, 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 uh, Can you hear me? Do I think you have a bandwidth issue? That's cool. How's that, Sharky? Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. I think. Then go ahead. Okay, let's keep. Let's try it. So, okay, so let's try and proceed. Um, let me try. I was going to try and screen share, but maybe that'll create. I think that maybe that was creating part of the problem. So you can see right now. You see slide three. The RCDSO. Okay, so though for those of you that are uh, part of the RCDSO, you're eligible for a Core 3 credit here. Um, for those of you that are part of the AGD, you're eligible for the AGD PACE program credit. Um, if you're looking for a certificate, um, let me know. You can reach out to myself or Sharky, and we can send that out to you after the event um, for both of those programs. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a chartered accountant. Uh, we have a, uh, I, I founded a, a, an accounting firm about 15 years ago, and we specialize in servicing the dental industry. So um, I'm also a tax specialist and a, a chartered professional accountant uh, in Ontario, Canada, as well as a certified public accountant in the United States, licensed in both the uh, US and Canada. And uh, my main focus is on uh, assisting dentists with uh, tax planning, mergers and acquisitions, buy sell of dental practices. So today, um, we're going to be talking about the main topic is for buyers of dental practices. And I'm going to go into a general dental economic update, just some information that we have in terms of what's happening in the market right now. I'm going to go through the buying process of buying a dental practice and give some guidance on how to conduct a chart audit. Um, if you're thinking about buying a practice, give you some uh, um, traps that we've seen uh, for buyers and some risks that uh, we've uh, seen in 
last you know many years and in, in various transactions that to be aware of and um for those of you that are looking for bank financing and give a quick update on that as well as uh COVID action plan um there's a few questions that have come out of the banking community in terms of uh what is your COVID action plan whether you're buying a practice or you're running a, a, a business so i'm going to go into some details about that and uh quick dental practice 101 valuation 101 uh, an update on what's happening in the market in terms of valuations uh uh, in this new environment and talk about some asset, some tax issues in terms of structuring the transaction, the deal, um, taking advantage of the lifetime capital gains exemption, how to structure it, how to multiply on that, on the eventual sale of the practice. And we'll have a quick Q and A at the end, uh, if anyone has any questions. And if you do have any questions as we go through, uh, please use the chat, uh, room as part of, uh, a way to, uh, keep track of those questions. And then we'll make sure all those questions get addressed, uh, uh, as we uh, go through the material. So in terms of uh, dental economic update, um, obviously um, uh, COVID-19 is a huge uh, uh, game changer and we're monitoring it um, uh, at the firm. And uh, just uh, some statistics here from the World Health Organization. This is back from June of um, 2020. And there was back then was about 9 million cases, um, uh, confirmed cases worldwide. And uh, 469 deaths and uh, a few uh, months after that we did a webinar and uh, we got some information which was uh, what was the uh, information in August so two months after that uh, which was in August about a month ago and there was about uh, 800,000 deaths and 23 million cases so there was a significant increase in cases and the uh, and the uh, confirmed cases uh, um, between June and um, uh, June and um, um, August. And then just uh, yesterday or today, we pulled another uh, same data from the World Health Organization. And, uh, you know, the cases are still up, increase of 24% in new cases um, compared to the last month. And uh, it's worldwide and 20, uh, almost 25% increase in deaths uh, since the last month. So, you know, definitely a game changer um you know this issue is uh worldwide so uh, uh you know you can't avoid it and it's a uh, dental practice industry wide so um you know that's the first uh you know the the, the covid uh covid 19 um pandemic is you know directly affecting all business industries so that was uh you know the first slide just general information now in terms of some information we have here from the united states a lot of the economic data that we have um, in North America is coming out of the United States, and they've had a you know larger incidences of uh, uh, of COVID nineteen cases. So uh, we've been monitoring some of the data that's been coming out of there in terms of um, how dental practices are pivoting, and uh, we're also comparing that to the Canadian data. So here you can see um, there's a survey done um dentist and it says what is the current status of your dental practice and this same question was asked um all the way back from the spring all the way through the summer and now in the fall and um 48.3 percent of those practices are open and business as usual so um that's a positive signal um and and 55.5 percent of the practices were open but lower patient volume than usual so it's obviously specific, uh, you know, depends on where you are in the country and where your practice is located that can affect that. But it's nice to see that overall there's been a growth trend. Um, there was a small decrease in September. So we're going to be monitoring this going into the fall as more data comes in um, into uh, the, the, the September and October months to see if that number of business as usual will continue as it's uh, increasing, as it sort of has been as a trend since the lockdown back in uh, up to, you know, into, after opening up back in June. Now, in terms of um, how does this week, uh, this is back in September data, uh, compared to what a typical, um, you know, week would be. And, you know, most offices are sitting at about, you know, uh, a weighted average of 74 to 81% are, uh, you know, back at what their typical week would be. And uh, that rate has been increasing uh, over uh, every week. It's been going up. So um, it is sort of leveling off, though, in terms of the growth rate. Like initially, there was a pent-up demand and the, and the number of uh, uh, 
uh, patient volume was increasing uh, at a higher rate in terms of changing per week, but now it's sort of leveled off at about 75, 80%. So we'll have to see how that uh, continues on through uh, as we pass through the fall. Uh, in terms of employment, um, most dental offices uh, have reached their uh, pre-COVID levels in terms of employment. Um, that's been helped uh, significantly by the government uh, weight subsidy programs and uh, as well as some of the, the, the fact that the uh, patient volumes have gone back up. So it's nice to see that the dental offices are about 96% of their uh, uh, you know, human resource capacity in terms of people coming back, which has been a great... Um, um, you know, a great help in terms of, uh, you know, uh, helping the community back with the dental care. So, and that's comparable to, you know, physicians and other healthcare practitioners and dentists are right there, um, close to physicians in ter terms of um, um, employment and getting uh, people back to work uh, throughout their practices. So that's been a good sign economically. Um, in terms of PPE, that was initially that was a huge issue um, back in the early days. Um, of the uh, pandemic and uh, that is also leveled off where uh, a lot more uh, practices um, have um, PPP, access to PPE and uh, it's been uh, uh, you know uh, something that uh, inventory uh, management issues have come up that have been able to help dentists they've been polishing up on their inventory management and uh, they've been able to to uh, manage that uh, well. Uh, recently, we heard some information that there was some trouble finding gloves in the market in terms of uh, the you know, gloves that fit. And, uh, and, and I'm not particularly sure why that is, but one dentist uh, uh, in Northern Ontario recently told me that he heard that there was a shortage of the material that's used to uh, manufacture gloves. It just resulted in a uh, shortage in gloves. So. Hopefully that uh, gets mitigated uh, as we uh, proceed through um, the fall as uh, PPE requirements are still gonna be, uh, looks like they're gonna be here for a while. Um, in terms of uh, readiness to go back to visit a dentist, uh, there was a survey done and um, you know, 55% of people were ready to go to the dentist. And one of the issues here was that almost 15% of people were uh, not comfortable uh, with resuming, um, you know, uh, visit to a dental practice. So that's the 15% that's uh, still on the sidelines. Um, and, um, and, and, and according to this uh, survey of the United States, uh, they had indicated that um, these people would not be, um, you know, interested in visiting a dental practice unless there was an approved COVID vaccine or proven medical protocol uh, to mitigate the remedy of the virus. So that's a significant uh, issue, and that's uh, something that could um, change the, the way that you're communicating with your patients and something to monitor in terms of the eco economics of how things progress. So you could almost correlate this back to the uh, previous slide where it showed that, you know, uh, there's about a 75 to 80% re recovery rate in patient volume. So maybe that shortfall could very well just be the people that are just maybe not coming back anytime soon, or they need to see some uh, you know, uh, uh, some medical uh, intervention or uh, vaccine or, or something to help them uh, uh, be more confident in, in, in going to an office. And that could be part of uh, changing the communications and uh, to your patients and whatnot. But um, definitely part of the economics of it. Um, in terms of um, there's a um, having a, r a rapid uh, COVID test, uh, how important do you think it is to have a rapid uh, point of care COVID testing uh, for patients, uh, dental team members, and, and, and dentists. Obviously, that's a, uh, a priority and something that people are interested in. Um, the American government has recently announced that they are um, they have ordered a significant number of uh, some rapid uh, tests uh, that people can use at home and uh, in 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 the line of healthcare. So uh, they have ordered those uh, testing uh, kits from Abbott Labs. So we'll have to see how those uh, change the um, psychology of people's uh, ability to go back to the dentist or go back to uh, regular um, everyday, uh, um, you know, normal activities in terms of, uh, you know, uh, testing themselves um, quickly. Um, and that's one of the issues that uh, hopefully will go into 2021. Um, in terms of the economic recovery, we're still kind of... Uh, 
wavering here. It looks like uh, it's going to be sort of like, it was interesting, like this is like they had the V-shaped recovery, which is the old, you know, the recession we had back in Canada back in 2017, 2018. And that's where, you know, the economy goes, you know, goes was, was hovering along and then it kind of bounces down and then the government comes in and puts in some uh, economic stimulus and it kind of bounces back up. And that was traditionally the uh, last few recessions that we've had in Canada. Uh, that's sort of the recovery that we've seen. In the United States, uh, this last uh, U-shaped recovery that they had was uh, they had a little bit more of an economic downturn back in 2018, 2000, 2008, 2009, mainly because their housing market had taken a little bit of a, uh, a pr pressure um, test and they uh, took longer to recover. So it's more of a U-shaped where you're down longer and then it takes longer to recover. <clears throat> and then some countries had what... Uh, uh, in Europe, they had really bad economic, uh, in uh, you know, situations, uh, uh, monetary policy and <clears throat> domestic uh, budgets. So they had a longer sort of L-shaped where they sort of went down and they sort of didn't really recover. So in terms of this uh, particular um, situation that we're in right now, it seems to be a, a sort of a K-shaped. So K-shaped is sort of, you know, you've got this sort of, you know, things were hovering along and then COVID sort of hit. And then some part of the economies are continuing to go up where other part of the economies are con continuing to decline because of the effect of the, co the, 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 the COVID-19 virus on certain industries, such as tourism, uh, airlines, uh, restaurants and whatnot. And they're not really seeing as big of a, a bounce back. So whereas other industries like healthcare, technology, financial services, uh, they're still continuing to expand and grow. So there's sort of a split in the dynamics of the recovery. So the um, so the concept that's come out of the last few uh, months has been like the K-shaped recovery, which is really a situation where you have part of the economy continuing to, to decline and another part of the economy continuing to uh, grow. So it's interesting to see how uh, dentistry falls into that. At the moment, it seems like it's sort of on the, uh, you know, on the mid-level, on the high level of the K-line, mid-high level, where it's still it's still seeing uh, continued uh, demand and continued um, continued growth in terms of utilization of technology, uh, implementing protocols, uh, government uh uh, acceptance of healthcare as a priority overall, and people still uh, having uh, healthcare as a priority uh, to their uh, livelihood and their and their and their lifestyle and whatnot. So that's a good sign overall so far um, since March. Now, in terms of the rebound, I mean, obviously we were you know things were closed down in um, April and May, and uh, in Ontario we didn't open up until June. Most of Canada, so we have seen that sort of rebound back where things have progressed and, and continue to grow. And, and we're we're going to be interesting to see how this uh, fall season and potential uh, you know inter you know combination between flu season and um, and the COVID nineteen um, uh, virus uh, as we go through possibly the second wave and how that uh, affects. Um, the uh, dental practice production uh, numbers as we go into the third qu fourth quarter of 2020, 2020 and into the first quarter of 2021. So we are definitely monitoring that, uh, but uh, definitely um, something to monitor in terms of patient visits and production. And in your own clinic, and even if you're buying a dental practice, you want to make sure you look at those trends, uh, look at the historical numbers between the previous uh, months in the comparable month for the uh, current period that you're purchasing the practice in, uh, uh, let's say, for example, you're, you're closing November, you want to look at, okay, well, how are they doing in June, July, August, and September in terms of um, the, um, the uh, patient visits and the production numbers and comparable to the previous year, you know, before or, uh, any of these issues. Um, so that's to generally just a general uh, quick uh, dental economic update uh, in terms of what we've been seeing. Um, now, for most of you, hopefully, uh, I'm not sure the um, the breakdown of the people here, but most people who potentially are buyers, I'm going to be going through um, the buying process now. So if you're looking to buy a dental practice, um, whether you're a practice owner who's looking to buy a second practice or third practice or fourth practice for that matter, or a dental associate who's possibly thinking of buying their first practice, 
um, all of these um, issues and uh, um, uh, and things I'm going to be discussing are relevant. So, so we put together a little quick little uh, summary sheet here, which summarizes the process of you know what the typical transaction looks like um, uh, uh, from beginning to end, and some of the things that you need to consider. So, you know, the first thing is, you know, assemble your team of advisors, whether it's your banker, your lawyer, your accountant, your insurance advisor and your team um, and start sort of some due diligence process. Generally, you'll get an appraisal or you'll, you'll be a private transaction. You'll get some financial information and then you're uh, going to do uh, uh, start maybe do an office visit, um, probably, you know, maybe an open house or meet the dentist kind of thing, uh, depending on the structure of the transaction. You're going to make an offer uh, at some point. Um, and then once your offer is accepted, you may uh, go to the bank, do a loan application. Then you're going to continue your due diligence at that point. Usually in the purchase and sale agreement, there's going to be a uh, provision to allow you for some time to get financing and uh, conduct certain due diligence procedures, do some legal uh, uh, checks and whatnot. Um, and then you're, you know, deal and then at that, during that process, you're going to be doing some negotiations um, with the seller. Uh, in terms of how long are they going to stick around and dealing with legal issues and whatnot. You want to build a team, uh, accountants, lawyers, bankers. Uh, if you're negotiating a lease, um, looking at that, looking at equipment inspections, uh, possible real estate inspections. If you're looking uh, to purchase real estate, you may need to get an a, a equipment, uh, I mean, a building inspection done or a, a commercial um, appraisal done uh, as part of the financing. Um, as part of the due diligence, you're going to look at the, you know, the visibility, the signage, you know, the, the, the interior of the office, the equipment, how things are laid out. If you need to make any changes, um, just yesterday we had actually gone to a uh, due diligence in uh, Northern Ontario, and um, the uh, purchaser was thinking that they, she may need to modify the practice. Uh, interior to comply with uh, some of the new COVID standards in terms of hygiene. So uh, by installing some doors, so there might be some costs involved that you need to consider in the layout of the office and how things are structured currently. Um, so that's, the, that's something to consider as part of a general uh, process. Um, you know, you're going to get the valuation, the practice profile, the financial information. You're going to be assembling financial information as part of the process. Um, demographic data about the location yeah, just yesterday while we were at the clinic uh, while we were there the dentist had visited the local chamber of commerce in that area to get some information and uh, they made an appointment to go uh, meet up with the chamber just to get uh, data on what's happening in the area and what's happening in terms of uh, growth rates and um, new developments and commercial developments and, and that kind of thing to help them uh, with their business plan um, you know, asking price assessment, looking at that, monitoring the office, looking at production reports. So I'm going to get into that in more detail later. Uh, looking at accounts receivable, reviewing the lease agreement. If you're buying the lease, uh, sorry, if you're leasing the office, um, looking at the terms of the lease, how many years are left. Um, outstanding dentistry, looking at, you know, how many cases are there that maybe a uh, dentistry that, that's, not, that's not being completed or treatments that have not quite commenced. So looking at outstanding dentistry available to you as the buyer <laughs> that may not have been done. Uh, looking at uh, specializations, orthodontic implants, things that you could maybe refer out that you may be able to refer in uh, going forward and potentially adding new services. Um, looking at the associateship agreements, if there's any agreements in place between employees and associates and hygienists and um, uh, just reviewing those agreements and seeing if there's any uh, risks uh, pertaining to that. Um, looking at um, other uh, practice management reports. Later on, I'm going to be showing a, a copy of like a, a dental association report where you can get information based on the postal code of the office of uh, the demographics of that area, how many dentists there are, males, females, uh, median income, that kind of thing. Um, looking at the procedure fee list and the fee guide, and comparing the two to see if uh, there's any opportunities for uh, uh, <clears throat> changing the way that uh, the billing is occurring in terms of the practice of the office. Um, when you go to the office, office visit, you're going to be able to uh, take a look at the layout. That's another part of sort of the process. Um, patient counts, chart audits, 
um, looking over the schedule and the appointment book <clears throat> to see if there's any uh, uh, holes in the schedule or the schedule's full or how many hygiene days they're booked, uh, what days the doctors are coming in, whether they're coming in, uh, whether they open on weekends, that kind of thing. Um, and then eventually you may end up making an offer and uh, there'll be a price allocation between how you're proceeding with the price in terms of uh, are you buying the assets, are you buying the shares, <clears throat> what's included, what's excluded, uh, when the closing date is, whether the accounts receivable of the office is included or excluded from the purchase price, um, uh, if the seller stays on, whether they'll be uh, compensated for uh, how they'll be con compensated and for how long and what are their responsibilities are going to be as the, uh, as the uh, previous owner after you buy the practice. What's going to happen to redos and how is that going to be reflected in the agreement in terms of a uh, patient comes in and you got to do a redo. Is that going to be the responsibility and cost of the buyer or the seller? Um, looking at uh, real estate, if you're purchasing the real estate, looking at that's a separate transaction and making sure that you have um, the proper uh, checks in place and legal um, uh, legal uh, channels in place. Some lawyers don't do real estate and you have to outsource it to a different lawyer. So you got to make sure that your lawyer is uh, aware of uh, uh, or, you're, or you've established which lawyer is going to be handling the purchase agreement and which one's going to be doing the real estate agreement. Could be a separate uh, department of the law firm or different, uh, could be all, all out different lawyer. Um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, loan application, so now in terms of the funding, you're going to have to um, provide the bank with documents to support your personal situation, uh, likely financial statements, tax returns, copies of your uh, personal statement of net worth, copies of the appraisal. So the bank is a, is a partner in the transaction because they're uh, likely going to be funding a signi significant portion of it. So you definitely want to make sure that uh, you're in great communication with your bank to make sure that they're comfortable with the transaction uh, early on in the process or uh, as the process continues because they're going to be fundamental to uh, the transaction uh, in terms of the financing. Uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit more later uh, about some of the concerns the banks have and some of the questions that they've raised uh, going into uh, the current environment. Um, and then you're going to continue due diligence. Um, you know, how you're going to structure the deal. Um, is it through your own corporation or you're going to have a partner or how you're structuring it? Is, you know, that's uh, you can talk to your advisors about uh, that as the process goes through. And as new information comes in, um, you may need to renegotiate certain parts of the agreement that you had originally um, uh, that you had originally drafted, and uh, you'll work with your team to ensure that you're putting together a fair deal on both sides, and uh, you, you're 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 summarizing the uh, you're summarizing the issues that you've raised throughout the uh, uh, process of getting all this information, and if you finding out that there's, there's any issues that are negatively affecting the valuation or there's conflicting data in the uh, that's in the appraisal and what may have been discovered either financially or uh, from the equipment inspection or whatnot, that you're summarizing that in some sort of uh, 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 way so you can present it back to the seller and say, look, this is what we've discovered and we would like to uh, mitigate uh, some of these concerns and, and how they get addressed will be depend on part of the negotiation uh, um, uh, with yourself and the um, and the seller. Um, as part of the closing, you know, once you close the transaction, um, and and even before you close, <laughs> there's some planning there. Well, you know, you're gonna have to take over the payroll. How is that going to be done? How are you going to be doing your accounting? How are you going to be dealing with the merchant banking systems? Uh, a lot of times, uh, we make sure that our clients deal with these issues before closing so that when they take over the business and they, you know, they're not like scrambling on the first day trying to figure out, well, you know, uh, the debit card machine set up or the credit card machine set up, it's already been done. Dealing with insurance. Um, one of the parts of closing a uh, transaction, uh, if you're dealing through a, uh, uh, a federally funded, uh, a, federal, a federal bank in Canada, for example, is they may require life insurance as part of a, uh, as part of the transaction to be um, uh, arranged with the uh, buyer. So you want to make sure that gets done before the closing. Um, also office overhead insurance, uh, business insurance, as well as like simple things like business card stationery. You know, uh, the, you may need to uh, change some of these things to 
um, depending on the type of transaction that it is. So you, these are things that you can do before you close, but uh, between the period that you're, uh, maybe the transaction still hasn't closed, but you're still moving toward a closing date and part of the planning of the closing procedures. Uh, could it even very well be like uh, evaluating the website and starting your marketing strategy as well, because that is something that may play into your um, into your uh, uh, post acquisition uh, business plan. Um, you know, after you've closed, um, you may want to send out uh, mailings or communications to the patients, informing them of the uh, of the changes in the office in terms of new ownership or partnership or uh, depending on the arrangement. Um, announcement cards, possibly newspaper, maybe some sort of grand reopening, um, uh, devising a marketing strategy for the for that period in terms of how things are going to be communicated, how things are going to be presented, communicating with the staff on how they're going to be uh, communicating things with the patients, uh, whether there's a new doctor, there's a new owner, that kind of thing, and how that's all going to be done uh, um, uh, internally and externally to uh, the outside world. Um, you know, looking at front desk uh, training and, you know, understanding who's doing what and understanding the system of the office and if things need to change. I mean, we usually advise buyers not to change too many things um, after you've, um, you know, purchased the practice just to kind of maintain some harmony uh, and sort of observe the systems and the staff and make sure, you, you know, just gather information that's not available and it's not easy to get before you buy the practice in terms of um, office scheduling and personal relationships and who's uh, available and who's got family commitments and who doesn't and and figuring all these things out and, and sort of allowing the office to continue over a set you know maybe a few months even just to kind of monitor and, and do an easy transition to try and avoid any drastic um, changes which could become a disaster in some cases where people um, negatively respond to drastic change and then they take it and they may leave the office and then you've lost what you've bought. So um, we've heard of cases where people, uh, there's been major exoduses of, of staff members from offices after a uh, acquisition. And uh, one way to mitigate that is simply just to ease it in, ease in the, ease into the, the, the purchase. Um, so, Open house planning, maybe we can do some uh, open house for the new uh, uh, or some sort of, uh, you know, uh, grand opening kind of thing. Um, looking at employee benefits plans, that could be part of the pre uh, uh, or the post um, due diligence to see what the costs of those are. Are they out there? What are they? How much do they cost? What, you know, what do they involve? Are there any commitments? And, um, you know, do you need to you need to look at it like uh, putting in different technologies? Uh, a lot of times we'll look at offices where maybe they're paper based and uh, the dentist wants to uh, implement uh, a uh, uh, paperless uh, uh, digital charts. So looking at that um, uh, as part of the post closing strategy and possibly pre closing strategy as well. Um, so that's sort of just a general list of the process. So you're buying a practice, you're going to go through this entire process. And um, now we're just going to get into a little bit more detail about some of the highlights of, of, of things to consider as you go through some of the more important parts of that process. Um, first of all, you're going to have to get a, a hybrid uh, uh, information from the seller. And uh, typically what happens in our case, uh, on our end, is we will um, be engaged by the purchaser to do the financial tax and uh, and, and uh, uh, so chart audit due diligence. And as part of that, once the offer has been made, we will then communicate directly with the, the uh, seller's accountants. And we will send them a communication uh, providing, uh, asking them to provide us with various financial information such as here, uh, the tax returns, the financial statements, the bank statements, the credit card statements, the, the payroll records the um, uh, production reports in the office uh, by billing code, uh, production reports, uh, uh, you know, there's a valuation report, which is, which is typical. And, um, you know, even recently filed tax returns, personal tax returns for the seller, if it's, a, uh, if it's not incorporated, just to uh, start <clears throat> validating um, the financial information that's in the uh, appraisal and that's been disclosed thus far and, and, and taking it a step further and ensuring that that financial information is um, 
uh, agreeing and, and, and validated through uh, some of the supporting uh, accounting records. Um, and then part of this process is assembling a team of advisors that specialize in the industry, uh, whether it's a lawyer, accountant, insurance person, um, you know, marketing person, dental contractor, even a sales rep, getting people together in your network and who are uh, understand the dental industry and getting them ready for um, when they when they're required through the process, whether it's a, a banker for the financing or a lawyer to review an agreement or an ins equipment inspector. And, um, you know, if you're dealing with one or two of, of these type of people in the industry, then they he may be able to help you open up their network to other people that could make sure that you can reduce the risk on the purchase of the of the practice. Um, now, in terms of all that financial information and all that uh, data that you're accumulating, once you have it, uh, one important thing to do is to analyze it and to sort of spread it out and sort of look at it and then a high level and sort of say, look, let's compare it and, and understand it and compare it to what's in the appraisal <clears throat> and look for trends inconsistencies, um, you know, um, discrepancies and things that, that are uh, abnormalities um, that, 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 that are out there that could affect your valuation. So <clears throat> I think it's important uh, to do that because you need to, um, you know, take this information and attack it, understand it <clears throat> and sort of uh, be able to critically analyze it and use it to your uh, benefit, and because that's uh, it's going to be this is a significant uh, transaction, and you know it could be in the millions and millions of dollars, and you want to make sure you're reducing any risks that are identified and using it as part of the negotiation. Uh, production analysis, you know, look at the uh, provider, who are the providers, are there any changes in providers? Um, you know, making sure you look at <coughs> the percentage of hygiene. As a, as, a, as a component of the practice, how it's changing, uh, uh, looking at the billing codes, um, looking at uh, trends and analysis, how things have fluctuated. And there's, there's huge, vast amounts of data in the uh, practice management software that are, that are available. And if you can <clears throat> request those things up front from the uh, seller, you can uh, use that to your advantage to help you identify the risks and opportunities in the practice. And, uh, you know, sometimes the seller's not even aware of uh, some things that you may identify and then they may very well agree with uh, your conclusion, whether it, you know, whether it could be the patient mix or the ODSP patients or, uh, you know, understanding if it's an assignment office or a non-assignment office in terms of the insurance and the copay and figuring out, um, you know, uh, how that's going to uh, change your, uh, uh, your running of the practice after the acquisition. Um, and then here's an example of just some percentage, uh, average percentage of, of uh, expenses as a percentage of gross production in various different categories. Um, you know, and you want to look at the financial information that's provided and make sure that it meets some of the, uh, um, the baseline tests for uh, for example, percentage of supplies as a percentage of gross revenue or, or, or lab as a percentage of gross revenue or, or salaries, just to get a benchmark and see if there could be an opportunity or possibly an error in the financial information that could identify possibly other issues. Um, in terms of uh, part of the due diligence process, um, looking at uh, dental association uh, uh, demographic reports. So, um, most dental organizations uh, provincially will provide um, statistical and um, demographic reporting uh, based on the postal code. So um, uh, most of our clients that are in Ontario, uh, we will recommend to them to do a uh, ODA dental economic uh, search. So if you contact the Ontario Dental Association, if you're a member, uh, most dentists are then uh, you can, um, they will provide, you provide them with three postal codes and they'll give you uh, a, dem a demographic report on that postal code region. And uh, here's an example. Uh, well, this is actually um, uh, a map of Ontario, which shows you the dentist to population ratio. So going back to the location, <clears throat> obviously for those of you that are looking to buy a practice or, or start a practice, uh, you know, it's, it's important to understand how many dentists are in that area and the population of that region. 
So this is an example of a of uh, uh, you know the darker green regions are regions in Ontario where there's less dentists essentially based on uh, uh, or there's a bigger demand for dentistry based on the population. Um, you know, the average dentist to population ratio in Ontario is about 1,500. There's about 14.5 million people in Ontario. There's about, um, you know, approximately 10,000 dentists. So the dentist to population ratio averages about 14 to 1,500 people for every dentist. So depending on what region you're in, it can make a big difference to the uh, supply gap between and demand uh, gap uh in that region depending on where you're opening a practice or where you're buying a practice it's definitely something you want to look at the dentist to population ratio here's an example of different counties in ontario and it shows you that for example in huron county there's 3104 people for every dentist whereas in uh, you know some other regions uh like waterloo there's 1677 people residents for every dentist and all those people may not necessarily go to the dentist all the time so you got to take that into consideration as well. So depending on what area you're in uh, and you're looking at, you want to use that demographic data to your advantage and uh, it could affect your decision whether to buy that practice or to uh, open that uh, new location. Um, this is an example of some other data where you can see where in the Metro Toronto area, for example, annual hours worked is 1,553 hours that are worked, but in some of these, um, other regions like Northern Ontario, dentists are working less. Also, uh, hygiene hours in greater Toronto area is like 1758, whereas hygiene hours in Northern Ontario are almost 3000 hours per year. So there's a significant difference in depending on the geographic location to the uh, amount of dentistry. Uh, could sometimes be uh, related to the fluoride treatment in terms of the water. Uh, some regions in Northern Ontario, uh, whether on septic or wells, they don't have fluoride in the water, so there's a higher incidence of caries. Um, number of days dentists are booked ahead, significantly higher in northern regions, 26.4 uh, days versus 10.5 days. That's a significant, uh, almost double the number of days booked ahead. Um, also, hygiene, um, you know, almost double as well, or more than double uh, in terms of days booked ahead, 83.3 days in northern um, uh, Ontario versus uh, only 40.2 days. So, you know, the northern regions do have their advantages, in um, but, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, people still like to be in the city. Or people is also um, not as favorable in uh, the greater Toronto area, and that can affect your decision of where you're buying the practice and something to look at as part of your due diligence. In terms of the economic report, uh, here's an example of one. So you put the postal code in there and then it gives you some statistical information about, you know, uh, the demographics and the gender and the years in practice of the dentists in that area. Um, and gives you an idea of how many GPs there are, how many specialists there are. Um, and this information is available for free, actually, from the Ontario Dental Association, for example. Of, uh, is this, one, this one was in the oil region. Um, now, I have two different reports. One of them is complimentary, I think, and then the other one they were charging, I think, 75 bucks. So um, definitely something to look at as part of your due diligence. Uh, getting access to this information is important because it will give you more data and uh, input in terms of what's happening uh, in, the, um, in the market that you're potentially looking to invest in. Um, you know, more data here, like it'll tell you about that particular uh, location, how many, you know, what the population is, uh, the average ages, the, um, it'll also give you the, um, some information about their median income. So definitely um, important information that you can be, that you can use as a, uh, 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 as a, as part of your due diligence. And uh, you have the more, uh, um, uh, important it is in, in terms of making that decision of investing, um, you know, thousands if not millions of dollars in that uh, practice location. Uh, just another example here, some more, same report, just more information, English speaking, French speaking, sometimes that makes a difference. Like uh, in the summer, we went up to uh, Penetanguishene and um, <clears throat> I didn't realize it was one of the uh, largest French speaking population in Ontario. So, um, you know, it can make a difference in French. So um, definitely something to look at uh, and, and investigate uh, as part of your due diligence process. So now 
um, this whole thing about the chart audit. So I'm just going to give you a quick update about, okay, you've got, you, you know, you, you've made it, you've made an offer, you've gone to the practice, um, you've arranged to make an appointment to go to the practice after hours, possibly with the, with the, with the seller or their seller's representative. And now you're been engaged to do a site audit, a site inspection and, uh, and you have access to go in and look at the charts. Sometimes the charts are going to be digital. Sometimes they're going to be paper. So it can depend and the procedures could change depending on the type of office that it is. If it's digital charts, you're going to have, uh, and whether it's digital or uh, paper, you should uh, obtain access to the um, computer system. So you can uh, uh, select some samples uh, from the uh, patients to determine if they're active or they're inactive and, and various different things. So I'm just going to go into a quick summary of some of the things that we look at or we advise our clients to look at if they're uh, conducting a chart audit. So the first thing about any, um, you know, auditing anything generally is you need to understand how the system works. So before you can conduct or plan an audit, you need to understand how does the system operate? So it could very well be just asking about, okay, how do we check in patients? How do they check out patients? What are the procedures with respect to deposits? Are they on, uh, you know, are they on uh, copay or, or, or are they on, sorry, assignment, non-assignment? Do they collect copay? Do they not collect copay? Um, you know, do they take credit card? Do they take check? Do they, you know, how do they deal with their um runnings of the office and and once you get a feeling for that in terms of a general flow chart of how things operate then you can proceed to test that system so in in terms of understanding that system the internal control environment you know whether it's paperwork or just general document flow most uh, dentists uh, when they go to a clinic they have a pretty good idea how things work because they've been operating in a clinic uh, for a long time so they they're comfortable with that but and and and, and most um Practices operate very similarly in terms of they usually have a practice management software and their uh, deposits and whatnot are run through the foot front desk. So um, it's not a complicated uh, uh, thing to figure out, um, but it's important to understand how the system works in order to ensure you can test it properly. So doing the chart audit, uh, we would recommend getting a uh, production uh, report by billing code. And then, um, and looking at that in more detail, looking at the billings uh, and the codes that are being generated, whether it's the, the uh, complete oral exams, how often are they being done, um, um, recall and emergency patients. Uh, you know, uh, you want to look at the number of procedures that are being conduct uh, that are being done, and, and and look if that's consistent with the number of patient visits. Um, look at opportunities for perio and endo work if there's things being outsourced or, or they're not doing. Uh, as many uh, as you would expect, and, uh, and maybe they're they're not um, taking advantage of that, or they're not really uh, outsourcing it, and they're just maintaining. You know, there, there's there's pent up treatment demand or outstanding dentistry. Um, looking at the polishing, fluoride, and scaling procedures, uh, sometimes uh, you know, even yesterday we were at a, a due diligence, and um, the dentist had identified that they were uh, the scaling units that they were uh, billing were not uh, didn't appear to be typical of what she expected for the uh, number of uh, the time that was being uh, scheduled for that patient. So that could be partly COVID related, but um, that's definitely something to look at in terms of the billing codes and seeing if there's opportunities to increase your uh, revenues uh, post acquisition. Um, you know, in-housing, in-house in outsourcing things, you know, if they're ortho and endo and implants and extractions and complicated extractions are all being outsourced to outside uh, dentists, there's a huge opportunity if the dentist comes in and is able to provide those services to uh, take advantage of that. So that can add to your business plan and potentially to your, uh, your, your, your buy where you can, you can add value by uh, uh, doing that work in-house or bringing in a perio person or a uh, orthodontist to do that type of work. Um, and, and one of the thing, main things too is determining the active patient count. How many patients are active? What is the total patient count? Sometimes the total patient count could be like a huge number because a lot of those uh, patients are not uh, active. They're still in the system, but they're still their name, their contact information may still be in the uh, practice management software, but uh, they're not active. So um, it's important to conduct uh, procedures and tests 
of that uh, database to determine uh, how often do these patients uh, attend the office, um, how long have they been uh, with the practice, do they live in, do they live in the area. There are uh, a lot of these practice management softwares have the ability to generate reports of uh, postal codes, uh, of, of where the patients live uh, in relation to the office, um, and whether when they last visited the office. And one of the important things in, in this chart audit is to do what we call as like a walkthrough or a cradle to grave test. So that is simply just picking a, a random patient. Um, and you can just look at a patient that was at the office, you know, the previous day or a patient that was, that is scheduled to be at the office the following day that you're there and then trace that patient through the system. So you just randomly select a patient. Let's say he came in yesterday. So technically, uh, you know, you should be able to pull the chart, see the notes of the, if it's paper chart, see the notes uh, that were made by the doctor in terms of uh, what was conducted. Uh, look at the fee that was charged, follow that through the system in terms of uh, collection. Did they make the co-payment? How did they make the co-payment? Look at the, look at the deposit book compared to the deposit book, uh, look at um, the insurance check. Uh, if you can't find the insurance check for that one, because it probably hasn't come through yet, you can go to the previous procedure that may have been, may have been done. I remember we looked at one yesterday and uh, they were looking at a transaction where the person had came at, come in, in in July. They had done a, uh, a hygiene appointment and they had come back in in August to do a, uh, a simple uh, restoration. And uh, they had simply uh, the dentist simply flowed that transaction through the tra through the system, and they had seen that yes, the individual had paid the the copay, and we and they they traced it back to the deposit in July, and they saw the insurance check come in uh, in uh, later uh, in August from the um, insurance company, and they traced it back to the deposit book. So that just shows that, um, and not only the deposit book but the insurance receipt. So that's just one transaction. So you're doing like extra procedures on one sample. So the idea is randomly select some samples, test the system, see how it operates, make sure it's working correctly. If you can test the system at various points at certain data points within like a particular year, for example, let's, you, you know, you don't have to test every single patient. You could look at, um, and this is a sort of audit sampling methodology, you could look at, let's say, 10 patients a month, for example. And if you test the system and you see that things are working, you understand, okay, things are being deposited and things are being collected and, and you're comfortable with the system that it's working correctly, then you can rely on the system. Then you can actually go into the system and say, look, this system is working and it's working properly and, the, and we've tested it. And we're, we're confident that the system is working. So that therefore we can go in pull reports from the system and rely on them to uh, make decisions as to how things are uh, working in the clinic. So it's important to test the system before relying on it. And that's why uh, we would recommend doing some audit sampling of uh, certain uh, certain uh, simple uh, things as a walkthrough, we call it a cradle to grave of, uh, of a patient coming in all the way to payment and insurance and uh, collection. Um, now, some of the other things you can do when you're at the clinic is comparing the production uh, from the practice management software to the financial statements that are reported to the government and the, and the financial statements and make sure there's no discrepancies. Um, look at the write-offs, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, there are not too many write-offs. Usually the average practice, we don't see too many write-offs. It shouldn't be more than 1% or 2% of the gross production. Um, now, the other test we like to do is looking at the bank statements. So you actually take the physical bank statements of the clinic and compare them to the collection report in the practice management software. Now you don't have to check every month, but again, you can select a sample, but we like to, um, you know, depending on uh, how comfortable we are with the internal control environment, um, it's an important procedure to ensure that the money that's being uh, reported in the practice management software is being collected is uh, being deposited into the bank account. Um, if there's a discrepancy noted, then we need to follow up with the seller and find out why that is. Uh, and hopefully there isn't, uh, I mean, in the industry, there hasn't been, uh, you know, too many problems that we've encountered in terms of that issue. Uh, later on, I'm going to be talking about some, uh, 
things that we've seen uh, through the years and uh, things to look out for in terms of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, cases where uh, there's been abnormalities. Uh, look at the accounts receivable ledger, make sure there's not too many uh, receivables outstanding. Um, receivables meaning, you know, customers that owe, uh, patients that owe the practice money. Uh, that could be an indication if there's a high receivable balance, that could be an indication of copay issues, uh, copay collection issues, and they aren't getting written off or being uh, waived properly. So that could re result in other problem problems uh, outside uh, like regulatory issues uh, that could raise risk in the, in, in the, in the purchase. Um, you know, and looking at the gross billings that are reported in the practice management software to the financial statements, that are provided in the appraisal, but also the tax return, because the financial statements um, that are uh, provided should also be reported similarly to the government. So you want to make sure that that all ties in. So there's no abnormalities there. Um, looking at the payroll records. So, <coughs> for example, as you all probably know, at the end of the year, you're going to have to, uh, for the employees, they issue T4 slips and a T4 summary. summary which summarizes all the employees that were paid during the year. So you want to make sure that um, it agrees to the financial statements. So if they're paying $200,000 in salaries and you look at, at those uh, people that are on that list, um, <coughs> that should agree to the information that's provided in the uh, evaluation as to who the you know hygienist or the assistants or whatnot. And the number should be close or, or, or in line with what's show, uh, disclosed in the financial statements as a total payroll expense. Um, and you want to make sure that's in line with the ODA averages, you know, anywhere from we like 25 to 27% is sort of a, an optimal uh, salary number for uh, uh, based on gross, uh, gross billings uh, annually for salaries. And you want to make sure that it's not over or, uh, you know, if it's under, uh, it could be an opportunity where the office is running efficiently, but that could also uh, create a red flag that uh, maybe there's other people being paid that are not on salary. Maybe they're being paid as independent contractors and it's in a different account. Um, you know, and uh, other considerations, like when you're out there on the site visit, uh, you got to do building inspection. If you're buying the building, if you're actually purchasing the real estate, um, equipment inspection. Um, we've uh, we were out there yesterday, and uh, the tech came in, and he uh, looked at the equipment, checked the suction, uh, evaluated the uh, uh, the equipment, and prepared a report to the to the to the buyer. Um, the um, in this particular case, uh, I was thinking yesterday, uh, the um, the buyer was purchasing a building, so. Uh, They've arranged for a building inspector to come in <clears throat> to look at the roof, to make sure structural there's no structural issues, and um, environmental issues as well. Some banks may require a phase one or four, phase two environmental test to be done, and that's where they go down and they um, drill a hole into the soil, pull out some a soil sample, and then um, test that soil sample to make sure there's no contamination in the uh, soil surrounding the the real estate. Um, the the requirement to do that really depends on the type of real estate that you're buying and the location of it and whether it's near or 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 I know how old the, the old it is and how it's zoned and you know if it is it close to or near a uh, uh, a business or such as a gas station or a uh, a factory of some sort that could uh, create um, environmental issues to the soil that doesn't really have anything to do with dentistry. But it just can affect the uh, the valuation of that uh, real estate, and you want to make sure that you find out about that when you buy the practice, not when you're selling the practice. And the buyer comes in when you're selling and starts doing that, and you and you and you find out about something that you uh, weren't aware of. And that's really the idea of doing all this uh, due diligence is to make sure that once you buy that practice, and once the financing has been completed. And once all the legal work and paperwork is all done and you're the owner of the business and you, and you get the keys, that anything that was disclosed to you, that you verified it to ensure that um, there's no surprises. So when uh, you buy that business, you've uh, conducted enough procedures and uh, uh, to help uh, mitigate any risks and to identify any risks. And uh, you bring them to the attention of the seller and possibly help you with the negotiation of uh, making sure you get a fair and reasonable deal. Um, traps for buyers, um, just a couple of cases here. 
of uh, different scenarios that I was just kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, documenting that could come up that could affect your, um, you know, uh, practice purchase. Um, Experienced office manager does not fit new management style. So that could be, you know, that's a tough one because a lot of times you don't get to personally meet the staff, uh, uh, you know, enough to really understand what, if there's any, uh, you know, problems with, uh, uh, you know, uh, people getting along well and working together well. And a lot of times, uh, front desk or office manager has been there for a long time, and they're really comfortable with the with the previous owner. And then when a new person comes in, they are sort of that honeymoon period where uh, you know you got to kind of make things work. So uh, that is always going to be something that is a risk, unless you are uh, associating at the clinic and then you know buying in, or, uh, or or if you have you know if you know the dentist and, and, and they allow you to actually interview the staff. Um, prior to purchase, which is not typically done, but it's something that could be asked uh, from the buyer. Um, patients received credits from vendor for insurance build prior to work performed. Um, yeah, that's a major issue. So I um, heard about a case where somebody purchased a dental practice and uh, after closing, they, patients had walked in uh, let's say in January, and they had done a dental procedure, and they found out that the person, the previous owner, had already pre-billed a treatment that wasn't done to the insurance, and they had given a credit to the um, to the uh, patient. And then when the dentist uh, who took over uh, did the treatment in let's say January, then the patient walked in and said, "Well, I'll put it on my credit." So that was a problem because uh, they were like, what are you talking about? And it was sort of like, well, there was some problems, you know, regulatory issues, obviously, with that dentist because they were overbilling for work that was not performed and then putting it on a credit for the patient and then utilizing it uh, subsequently. So that's uh, definitely something that uh, needs to be, uh, you need to be aware of. Uh, and you need to try and figure out a way if uh, as part of the audit test to make sure that isn't happening or it can be um, mitigated by uh, having a holdback in the purchase and sale agreement. That's where I said the purchase price is $2 million <coughs> and then you don't give them the $2 million. You give them, let's say, $1.8 million and then the two hundred dollars gets held back uh, subject to uh, other uh, post-acquisition uh, uh, information. Um, all patients were not paying co-payments. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a problem. And that's one thing, uh, one way to mitigate that in terms of due diligence is to make sure that um, uh, you compare the uh, practice management reports to the bank statements um, and also, um, you know, understand uh, the, the walkthroughs and the, and, the, and the cradle to grave testing to mitigate that and uh, just understanding that. And that's a problem. That could be a regulatory problem. A lot of dentists, uh, if they ever discover something like that pre-purchase, they'll walk away because uh, they don't want to be dealing with uh, uh, the regulatory issue and they don't want to be dealing with uh, trying to convince patients to stick around if uh, they were used to uh, some co-pay adjustments that, doesn't, that don't make sense to them and, and they, be, they don't want to take on that risk. Uh, Patients were mainly TMJ specialized patients. So that's where it's important to look at the billing codes. Uh, you want to make sure that there's no specialization going on that's outside of the realm of your, uh, you know, your your type of uh, service services that you can provide. Uh, if you're buying a practice and you all of a sudden figure out that there's a whole bunch of TMJ stuff going on and, and the, you know, and you already bought the practice, that's going to be a huge problem. Um, and that's simply just looking at the charts looking at the uh, notes and looking at the billing codes and understanding that pre-acquisition. Uh, vendor failed to disclose material contracts. Uh, that could be a situation where let's say making sure that all the contracts that are in place to, um, for example, let's say they have a marketing contract or a lease agreement and it's not disclosed to you and then you buy the practice and then uh, you open up the mail and you get a letter saying, okay, you know, you've got to pay this much per month uh, and it wasn't disclosed to you, that can become a problem. Uh, and you want to make sure that all material contracts are disclosed and that there's a clause in the purchase and sale agreement to protect you in case that happens. 
you can get your lawyer to help you with that as well. Um, vendors switch computers and equipment after inspection. So that's like after closing, you know, you go into the office and you're like, well, look, uh, you know, they, they switch the x-ray machine or they switch the computers. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you do an inventory count or arrange an inventory count uh, date, inspection date before the closing to make sure that you all the stuff that you observed, uh, the equipment and everything that's supposed to be there is there uh, before you take over the clinic. Um, and definitely uh, not something you want to be finding out after you uh, uh, get the keys. Uh, office managers, lawyer to vendor dentist. That's similar to the previous one where uh, there's, you know, the ma office manager doesn't fit the management style. So got to, you know, work that through. It's an HR issue. Uh, you know, we've seen cases where the office manager will just keep billing the, the previous dentist, uh, not billing, but uh, uh, booking the previous dentist. Um, and then uh, not to the new dentist. So definitely something that um, can be addressed simply by uh, communication uh, uh, post-acquisition uh, between the buyer, the seller, and the staff and, and understanding that you're all in it together. It's a team. And, uh, and, and what's good for the buyer is good for the seller too. So um, vendor was a great salesman. New dentist was conservative. So that's part of the philosophy. Um and you can get an idea uh, of the philosophy of the dentist by looking, by meeting with them prior to the closing or <clears throat> looking at their charts and their treatment coordinating and seeing what they're doing and making sure that it's a good fit. Um, vendor was recently charged with a serious allegation. Um, yeah, that's definitely a problem that could be affect the value of the business. So, uh, uh, you know, checking uh, local newspapers in the area to see if there's any, um, anything uh, that could affect the value of the business negatively. Um, chart audit revealed inactive patient charts in active patient cabinet. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, on paper charts, you got to make sure that uh, they've uh, that they properly called and purged the charts. Um, you know, these days, a lot of digital charts, but uh, digital even, you can do a full patient check, you know, tell you how many patients are in the database. And a lot of the practice management softwares will tell you how many of those are uh, active and inactive and you can test that as well by uh, doing some of that testing uh, that we talked about earlier as part of the chart audit um, practice management software relief re revealed less charts than those disclosed by the vendor <clears throat> yeah a lot of these um, practice management appraisals and valuation reports will indicate like an approximate uh, chart count or active patient number so you definitely want to bring that to the attention of the seller uh, if you find any abnormalities, uh, demolition clauses in the lease. I mean, that could be huge demolition clauses where there's something in the lease that basically says that the, um, the, uh, landlord can give you notice, right. To tear down the property and you can kick you out of the place within three, six or nine months. So that's a huge problem, um, for a buyer and they could kill the deal as well. If the bank's involved, because the banks don't like that. Usually if there's a demolition clause in place, uh, majority of patients were outside of the service area. Uh, yeah, that could be a huge issue these days because a lot of people moving around, working from home, if you're buying a practice, let's say in downtown and, um, you do a, um, a search in the practice management software and you find out that the postal codes are where these people actually live is nowhere near the downtown area. And they were like, you know, taking the train in to go to Bay street, um, that could be a major problem because uh, especially in this environment that we're in uh, post uh, COVID-19 in terms of, um, you know, those people are not going to be available for, to come back to the office, uh, you know, anytime soon or depending on uh, how things switch and change over the next few months. So um, that could affect your, uh, the valuation of that clinic and uh, potentially the uh, entire transaction could be, uh, uh, changed uh, dramatically by something like that. So um, uh, last one here, majority of patients did not fit well with the purchaser's ethnicity and language. Uh, yeah, definitely uh, got to look at uh, language uh, issues. If the seller speaks a different specific language and you're not fluent in that language and, and that, that can become a major problem uh, to realize on your investment. So Let's so some high level uh, uh, things that uh, we've seen uh, things to be aware of when you're when you're buying a practice. Um, 
this is just another example of um, making sure that in the accounting of the expenses, if you no notice any abnormalities in certain percentages of, uh, for example, uh, supplies, you know, um, if they're uh, too high, that could be an indication of uh, uh, possibly, uh, you know, misallocation of certain expenses. So doing that analysis of the expenses as a percentage of gross revenue is important to determine if there's any abnormalities and maybe other expenses that are going through that, uh, that uh, are not part of uh, normal operations. And that could change the value of the clinic, uh, depending on if it's underreported under or overreported. So, um, you know, being more detailed in the due diligence is important in terms of the financial. Um, phantom income. Uh, this example where um, somebody, when they looked at the bank statements and compared to the practice management reports, there was a difference. So um, a lot of times that could very well be where um, the dentist may be associating at a different clinic uh, outside of his general practice, and they're depositing money into the um, um, into the bank account, but it's not part of the practice. So it is income to the dentist, uh, but it's not actually part of the um, uh, it's not actually part of the practice that you're buying. So and it's very common that dentists could be uh, providing other services uh, outside of that clinic, uh, especially if they're a specialist or they're doing sedation or IV or, or they're doing other associate work outside of that clinic, but they're still depositing it into the corporate account. So in the bank account, it shows up. But if you look at it, when you look at the practice manager's offer, it's not there. So that could be a huge problem uh, and could inflate the value of the um, practice, even though, um, uh, you know, it, they weren't really doing anything wrong, but it's just a misdisclosure and it may not be fully transparent from the financial information. You have to dig deeper into the practice management software to actually uh, uh, discover that. Um, so this is somebody who was operating uh, a practice and they were providing um, full mouth restoration services. So what happened here is, you know, general GP practice, you got a lot of recall, you're building a lot of goodwill with your patients and people are coming back on a regular basis. Whereas with uh, uh, prosthodontist uh, practice, it could be just like they're doing something completing the project and then they're done and they're not seeing the recall component of that. So uh, again, important to understand the practice management software and understanding uh, the components of uh, making sure that um, the work that's being done is uh, the type of work that you would expect for a um, the practice that you're buying. Uh, similar to that TMJ uh, example earlier. Um, this was an example where uh, purchase price, asking price was more than $300,000 higher. Uh, okay, so what happens is very common in the um, dental valuation uh, process where if there's something running through the practice that's um, uh, not typical of the, of the operations, such as uh, uh, continuing education. So let's say the dentist who runs the practice does a lot of CE and they're running it through the practice, when they're doing the valuation, they'll add that back to the profits and say, well, their profits are actually higher than what's showing in the financial statements. Because if you buy this practice, you're not going to have to do all this, um, you know, continuing education that this guy was doing because he was doing something out of the ordinary or he's taking a course that's uh, outside the, the scope of, uh, you know, running a regular GP practice. So they add it back to the income and then they use it as a basis for determining the cash flow, which uh, eventually results in uh, helping determine the value of the clinic. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to understand what those addbacks are because it's very common in a dental, dental practice appraisal where you'll see addbacks of um, various different things uh, that are being added back, but they need to be defended and, and supported and, 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 and understood uh, in, in order to, uh, because that can change the, 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 the formula and calculation of the value uh, of the uh, of the clinic. 
So um, watch out for that and make sure that you're doing, uh, as part of your due diligence, you're vetting out all those uh, adjustments that are made to the income uh, uh, that's being reported on the financial statements. Um, put it on my credit. I talked about that earlier with somebody, the vendor was billing the insurance for work not performed. Uh, that's a huge problem. And then uh, the vendor inherited uh, the charts and, uh, you know, potentially college matter too. But that's a um, huge uh, uh, thing to look out for and make sure that, you know, you got to do some due diligence to dig a little deeper in the chart audit to make sure that um, nothing like that is happening. And, and that could be done through uh, reviewing the charts and part of that sample cradle grave testing and sample testing <clears throat> that's done uh, pre pre acquisition. Um, this is a similar example as mentioning earlier where uh, they had uh, multiple clinics and they were um, running production. Uh, it was kind of like a, a more of an accounting issue because they would be running um, revenue from different sources, like associateship income was going in through uh, the, the practice, for example. And one way to vet that out is simply by looking at the, the, the percentages. Because when you look at the percentage of, for example, uh, salaries and wages as a percentage of gross production, you can see that it's going to be offline. And, there's, and, and, and that's going to play out simply by saying, well, look, why? how is it possible that wages are like 10% of gross production that's way under um, the average of the of the industry and, and, and whatnot. So then you can, you know, sort of uh, sniff that out as part of the uh, financial analysis portion of the uh, due diligence. Um, talked about this too, picking and choosing uh, which assets are included, like, you know, uh, making sure that all the stuff that you're buying, the equipment and everything is is uh, is, is reviewed and double checked, and and, and, and the inventory count is conducted. So if you have you know like a, a practice valuation, it's got detailed information. Well, well, you know what kind of chairs you're getting, what kind of equipment you're getting, the model numbers and whatnot. You want to make sure you do a little quick uh, run around the office and you know check those off and make sure that those are uh, actually in the clinic because that could change the. Uh, dynamics of the valuation, depending on the chair, type of chair, type of equipment, type of technology that's in there. Um, this example, bait and switch, um, it's called bait and switch here, but really what this example of was somebody said, oh, I want to sell 100% of my practice, and then they go through the negotiations, and at the end, they're like, well, I actually just wanted a partner. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, I just want to make sure everything's uh, open and upfront, uh, that you negotiated up front in terms of the, the, the motivation objectives of the, of the, of the, of the seller. Um, yeah, so that's, those are some examples of um, situations that could happen uh, through the trials and tribulations of a mergers and acquisition uh, in terms of um, risks that can come up and how to mitigate those risks and being aware of those issues so that when you do uh, get into the buying and selling of a practice or buying a practice that you are at least aware of those issues and you're conducting procedures that are helping you mitigate that. Um, chapter five, COVID action plan and bank financing. So the banks are still lending, deals are still happening. Um, we've uh, done uh, many, many transactions post, uh, you know, COVID. Um, when I say post COVID, I basically mean like after COVID was announced and kind of like, a, you know, really post lockdown. Um, a lot more startups, uh, a lot of people buying secondary practices for, for dentists that had like two or three practices and dentists are starting to, uh, you know, shift um, into other practices. So there's a list here of some uh, questions that you might encounter and things that you need to consider as well as part of your uh, purchase of a dental practice. So, and these are the questions that the banks may ask you. Um, <coughs> how have you found the reopening of the clinic? Um, have you had to retro retrofit your practice in order to comply with the guidelines? Have you taken advantage of government programs such as uh, Canada Emergency Business Account, <clears throat> Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, Canada Emergency uh, Commercial Rent Assistance? So <clears throat> banks are, you know, mortgage deferrals. Banks want to know uh, how existing owners are managing their clinic. Um, how are you managing your cash flow? Uh, how are you managing your expenses? So banks are really drilling down more now in terms 
terms of finding out, um, you know, what's happening with uh, the practice. Um, Sharky, just you know, about the five more minutes. I see you here. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. That's yeah. That's good. Five minutes. Yeah. Did uh, let's see where. We were a bank, yeah. Bankers on the show. I mean, will they be uh, participants? If they're not, if you do want copies of the slides, let me know. Uh, you can send me an email. Uh, there is some more, you know, here's an example of a COVID action plan. Uh, now, this is an interesting article. We only have a few minutes left. But there's an interesting article in the Global Mail in August where there was actually vet practices that went to, uh, that were sold, originally purchased for like two or three times earnings about seven or eight years ago, and they were sold for 22 times EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And the reason that a private equity firm bought this group of vet practices uh, for such a high valuation, uh, because they, they felt that those uh, vet practices were COVID friendly. And they were looking to purchase a book of business that was uh, uh, giving them a high cash flow rate of return, but not subject to COVID risks, such as, um, airline industry and in restaurants and in other industries like tourism so <clears throat> how this resonates to dentistry we don't know but uh i just highlighted here where it talks about the 22 times earnings and it was actually um the seller was actually imperial capital who was one of the original investors of uh of dental corp um so it's interesting to see how um COVID is actually, uh, you know, vet practices and dental practices are, are different, but they're also quite similar because they're still in the healthcare uh, sector. So time will tell to see how <coughs> valuations uh, uh, play out. Um, but here's an example of a, probit, uh, a COVID valuation pre-COVID where things were like seven or eight times earnings or something would be worth <clears throat> 1.6 million. And then, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> depending on how, uh, things change in the uh, in the uh, multiple. Uh, it can dramatically change the valuation, and also um, the way that associates are being paid can also affect. And the costs of the practice, whether they're up or down, can dramatically affect the valuation of a clinic. So, definitely something to look at. Um, for those of you that are looking to buy a practice, <clears throat> we talked briefly about the eight hundred thousand dollar, eight hundred eighty three thousand dollar lifetime capital gains exemption. Uh, making sure you're structuring it properly from the beginning. Uh, with different family members potentially. Uh, for those of you uh, who have a dental professional corporation, you can add family members, your spouse, your children, and your parents, uh, and you can all uh, get the uh, $883,000 lifetime capital gains exemption each on the sale of a practice. So there's a huge opportunity to defer some tax. Um, quick tax update, you know, if you're incorporated, you get the 12.2% tax rate. And um, yeah, negotiating the transaction, uh, you know, uh, risk is, risks have increased uh, in the new environment with COVID-19 in terms of due diligence. Uh, cash flow is everything. So making sure you understand the cash flow. And um, is it a buyer's market? Things have balanced out a little bit, but uh, it's still early in the game to see how things play out, especially with the private equity and uh, looking for a home. Um, there's definitely been... Um, uh, uh you know transactions that are uh that are that are, that are you know higher valuations we have seen uh, recently uh email me uh we have a specialized checklist uh for dental practices email me uh a tool.mira at mnco.ca or give me a call at uh at my office and um we can send you the due diligence checklist for those of you that want copies of these slides will uh you can shoot me an email and uh we're happy to send that out and um, if you guys have any questions, um, uh, let me know. Sh uh, reach, reach out to the reach out to me. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a huge, huge topic, and uh, uh, look forward to uh, seeing how things play out in the fourth quarter of 2020. Yeah, thank you very much, Atul. Uh, for everyone that's attending, uh, we have time for maybe just a couple of questions. So you have questions please type in the chat message section. And we'll answer it quickly, a little bit tight for time. Um, same for those people on YouTube, Facebook, uh, feel free to type the message 
in there, questions that you want to ask. That was a lot of content. There's a question here. Is it okay to take screenshots or photos of the slides? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, she said for the slides. Or so, yeah, slides will be available. Uh, everyone's contact will be provided to a tool, and he'll be able to reach out and send everyone a copy of the presentation as well. Because um, there's a lot of content. Uh, it's hard to uh, mentally capture all of that. As well as a bonus for everyone that's attending, you'll be able to uh, watch this this glorious presentation on demand, watch over and over again uh, to make sure you absorb all the wisdom provided by our tool. Um, so while we wait for questions, um, I just want to tell you about the upcoming webinar. So the next one is Wednesday, October the 14th. Uh, that's Sean Pierce, president of Dental Pierce. And uh, the most important thing for the success of a practice is the teamwork. And he will be talking about the main pillars of a winning dental team, what we need to do, how you need to communicate, and what it feels like, and the simple things. Simple things make a big difference. Uh, so you wanna reach out to me uh, for about the webinars, uh, topics that you want, uh, <clears throat> good things, bad things, things to improve. You can send me a personal email or you can call me directly. Um, same thing with a tool. You can contact him with his email as well. Okay. Uh, so more question question here. Here. Our practice is doing at a cash flow level post COVID in light of billings recovery. Cash flow has been pretty good. I mean, you got to keep in mind there's a, the government subsidies as well that have helped. And um, so it's been quite stable, uh, depending on the location, you know, um, if things in the in suburbs have done a lot better, uh, downtown, a little bit more challenging uh, with the uh, with the with the exodus of a lot of commercial. But yeah, um, definitely a case by case question too, depending on the practice and location. Um, northern regions haven't been affected as much. Uh, but um, Cash flow has still been strong because uh, uh, people are, you know, they're also cutting out other costs that they may have been spending before on other things like CE and um, leisure activities and whatnot, even though, you know, if they're directly or indirectly related to the practice, you know, it could be simply like flying to Vancouver, flying to a conference, uh, flying internationally for business. Those things are very muted. So there's been less of those costs and more focus on the clinic. So um, survival of the fittest. Okay, that's great. And we have another question here. Uh, at this point, has the valuation of buying a practice increased or decreased? It's looking like, uh, based on that article I showed you, maybe uh, this, it, I'm trending up because uh, there's not, there's only so many businesses out there that are that are open, that are protected, that are and healthcare is healthcare, technology, financial services, um, you know, environmental stuff is all in the uptick. You know, uh, industries like restaurants, tourism, um, hotels, uh, you know, Airbnb kind of thing, like anything like that is all like you know downward trending. But technology, healthcare, uh, you know, uh, finance, um, uh, IT, computer-related, uh, you know, anything to do with pharmaceutical is sort of the uptick right now. But some of these other traditional leisure businesses, you know, real estate still kind of, you know, commercial real estate's a little bit tight. But residential real estate, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, sheltering home now, looking, you know, they don't want to live in a they don't live in a condo. They might want to live in a house or whatnot. So they're looking for more space, they're working from home, whatever the case is. So um, valuations are tricky. But for dental practices, it looks like it's stable. There's still demand out there. Uh, there's still buyers. There's still sellers. And it's still balanced. And uh, a lot of dental offices haven't reopened at the same level. Oh, guys are in their 60s and 70s. So now there's more people with a dentist. So other practices are taking up that... Uh, pent up, you know, uh, demand or, or other, you know, people who don't have dentists. So um, 
if you're in the right location and you have the right marketing strategy and you right to have the right uh, team in place and uh, you know in the right location you can take advantage of this opportunity yeah yeah now like i said earlier when something hit something big happens there's always opportunity so there's always uh opportunity and um yeah so you want to stay up to date and keep yourself uh, educated um so thank you everyone any additional questions please feel free to email a uh, tool i'm sure we can have sure. him back uh he sped through the last part there and uh, it's very valuable information um, and we have him uh, for a panel discussion coming up in a few weeks thank you and now Great. you guys will be redirected to dentistry business where you can sign up for future webinars thank you bye, bye everyone. Good evening. Thanks, Sharky. Appreciate it. Thank you to all.